on to session two. It's on the evolution of parliamentary democracy and the constitution of the Cayman Islands. It's principles of the Westminster model of parliamentary democracy, other democratic models of government, governance, sorry, the legal basis of parliament and the Cayman Islands. The presenter this morning is Mr. Steve McPhail, BLLB, CMH. Mr. McPhail is a local, local attorney with a number of years of practice in law under his belt and has a wide knowledge of the Constitution. Um, Mr. McPhail represented the Cayman Islands government at the overseas countries and territories of the European Union Forum in New Caledonian and Caracas at the Caribbean Overseas Committees and Territories meetings. Um, thank you, um, Mr. McPhail. Um, thank you. This. First of all, I want to thank the CPA for inviting me to speak to them about the, um, the evolution of parliamentary democracy and the constitution of the Cayman Islands. Now, <clears throat> our development is very unique in, it, in that it, um, it didn't follow much, many of the, um, of the established democratic systems around the Caribbean and in other countries. So it's, it's, I'm going to take a little time to give you a little historical background of how we started and why we are here today. First of all, um, we have to understand that um, after the sighting of Columbus, Columbus, there were, there were no people in Cayman Islands. The, the island was not populated. And colonization only began shortly after the conquest of Jamaica in, it, in 1655 by the British Army, led by Admiral Penn and General Venables, that were sent out by Lord Cromwell. The Cayman Islands then were adjacent to, to Jamaica. And it is not known whether at the time that the Spaniards were um, um, in Jamaica, whether or not there were any settlements, Spanish settlements in the Cayman Islands. But I believe that I'm right to say that there were no settlements in Cayman Islands and it was only after a series of land grants to merchants in Jamaica that the Cayman Islands became populated. For example, um, uh, and, and, and for example, for, 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 the, for the members of the, of the Legislative Assembly here, um, land grants were given in 1735 to Daniel Campbell, John Middleton, and Mary Campbell. And Camp, the Campbells and the Middletons own the entire stretch of land between North Sound and Raid Bay, including what is now Crew Road, Halfway Pond, and Tropical Gardens, approximately 3,000 acres. And later on, in 1741, Murray Campbell um, um, and, and, and William Foster um, were giving lands north of the Campbells and that was all of the land from north of the Campbells all the way to West Bay. And Foster was, was granted all of the present Georgetown Center to the south um, to pull in Badam Point. That would be out in, out in, out in uh, South Sound. And then later on in 1742, Mary Borden was given a grant of land of over a thousand acres from Newlands to, um, to Borden Town. So that is how the settlement started in Grand Cayman. Now, um, as I've said, um, the Cayman Islands um, then became administratively attached to Jamaica without any proper legal or constitutional status. It was loose. There was no legal or constitutional status. But that de facto arrangement between Jamaica and the Cayman Islands placed the governor of Jamaica as the governor of the Cayman Islands. Now, this situation was ideal for the colonial office at Whitehall because the King government did not have the problem of a separate colonial administration for the Cayman Islands. Now, under that colonial justice justification, the authority of the governors of Jamaica in the Cayman Islands was also the, the governor of the Cayman Islands 
and that was exercised by appointed magistrates and what we call castuses with, with limited administration powers. Now, the, the whole ad, advent of slavery, the, the economy started to thrive. Um, at, at one time, Cayman Islands, the Cayman Islands was one of the most prosperous islands in the, in the Caribbean. And um, they were exporting uh, corn, cotton, uh, many thousand tons of cotton a year, and, um, and even horses and, 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 and timber. Georgetown, as we all know, was, was a forest, uh, a mahogany and, and, and cedar forest. And, um, and that lumber was being exported to Jamaica and then to the United Kingdom. But there was a problem. Because every time a Caymanian um, boat went into a Jamaican harbor, it was tax. It had to pay a tonnage tax, and this became this became a, 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 a contention to the Caymanian merchants. There were no um, baptism or marriage registry in Cayman Islands. A person had to travel to Jamaica, Savannah, Lamar, Black River, or Montego Bay. To, to be married. Now, so the people were, formerly, were fairly happy with a good standard of living, and, um, and there was, there was, there was there, the, life was enjoyable, and then there were certain events that happened between the time of settlement and 1832. Now, one of the senior magistrates named James Coe had brought, bought slaves illegally from from Cuba, and of course, um, in 1820, uh, the British government had passed the Anti-Slavery Act that said that you could not transport slaves from one British colony to the other because they were getting ready for emancipation. Now, what happened with that incident was that um, a, a, a Cuban Don named Don Solongo entered the Cayman Islands without authority and forcefully recovered his slaves, and, um, and he also petitioned Whitehall about a breach of the law uh, that the Caymanians um, people had, uh, had, had, had done. And also, in 1820, um, there was the notorious tri trial of Long Celia, who was arrested and tried for sedition. She was found guilty by a jury of 12 people, and, and uh, her, her, her punishment was, was uh, 50 lashes on her bare bottom on her bare on her bare bottom and in, in public place, and this this caused a lot of problems between the masters and, and slaves. And then in 1826, um, one of the slaves were named Hannibal was charged with obia, and was deported um, to to Belize. And then, of course, the events surrounding the 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 the, the um, happenings in Haiti, the Haitians. Had, had overthrown their masters, had overthrown Napoleon, and they had um, became independent. And of course, the, the, um, the masters and, the, and, the, and all the, the men in, in Cayman Islands were very worried about this, and, um, and they wanted to, to, um, some sort of legal, constitutional protection from, uh, uh, from, from the governor of Jamaica. And that is where I can say our democracy started. Because the this and, 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 and more importantly was the slave revolt that was that was being pen, that was pending in Jamaica. And and we know that that happened in, 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 in December 1831 in Montego Bay with the Sam Sharp Rebellion, the Baptist War they call it, and Caymanians who had who had been traveling to Jamaica, to Black River, and to all, all those other ports were aware that this was happening and they were fearful because they had no protection. And then the magistrate and chief, the chief magistrate and Custis, John Drayton, Wade Watler Borden, and Robert Stephen Watler drafted a letter addressed to Lord Balmore, the governor of Jamaica, outlining the fares um, that I have been talking about. Um, the letter was dated 26 of October 1831. It was signed by Drayton, Borden, and Watler. And it asks for several things. It asked for the appointment of more magistrates because some of the magistrates had gone out to the Bay Islands that were also British and, um, and were making a better life there. 
it asked for that the governor appoint, um, give them authority to appoint a militia to protect the Cayman the, the Islands. It also asked the governor to allow them to raise taxes uh, to support the militia. And it also asked the governor to enlarge the petty court's jurisdiction to enforce a judgment debt for any amount by imprisonment. And it also answered the question of whether uh, the court had sufficient and competent jurisdiction to prosecute for a debt of any amount. And there was, uh, there was no mechanism to appeal to a court from a court from the petty court in, Jama in Cayman to a court in Jamaica. And it also asked the question of whether or not an American uh, from Boston who was very wealthy um, merchant in, in, in Borden Town named Nathaniel Glover, whether or not he could be appointed a justice of the peace. And so Watler went off to Spanish Town, San Diego de la Vega to see the go Governor Balmore and had a talk with him to take the Caymanians' request. Now, what happened in Jamaica was that the governor um, refused the request of the Caymanians and said that the only thing that he could, he, he could do for them was to appoint a few more magistrates, but he couldn't give them any power to, re re to raise the militia or to um, enlarge the power of the predecession court and so forth. And he said that those things had to be sent to the colonial office in Whitehall and that Watler would be, would, would, if, if he would mind it, that he would get the assistance of, this, of the secretary um, to the Jamaica legislature to help him to frame the document to send off to, to, to United Kingdom. Of course, Watler became very angry with that and, um, and he returned sometimes in, in late November that year, 1831, to the Cayman Islands. Now, after his return, um, there was a meeting call in Pedro St. James on the, on the 5th of December. All the freed men were asked uh, to come to see Pedro St. James. And at that meeting in Pedro St. James on the 5th of December, they decided that they were going to um, defy the United Kingdom, defy the governor of Jamaica, and to start their own legislature. Um, and what happened then was that they set the election of, of the legislature for the 10th of December, 1831. And um, in 1831, um, they met, on a, it was on a Saturday in 1831, and they elected themselves. They fashioned a legislature of the legislature in Jamaica, and the legislature consisted of elected members called Westry, the Westrymen, and the magistrates. And they, it was a, the legislature became, had a, was a bicameral legislature, a up, lower house and an upper house. And, um, and there were representation from Borden Town, um, had, had two representations, Prospect had two representation, representation because at that time Prospect was one of the most wealthiest districts in, in, in Cayman Islands. Georgetown had three, West Bay had one, two, and South West Sound um, had one. There was no representation from East End at that time. And there were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten magistrates and the elected members. Now, they had rented the, 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 the establishment of Pedro St. James to, for the seat of government. And the legislature met downstairs, and the, the, the vestry met downstairs, and the magistrate met, up, met upstairs. And the expatriate, Nathaniel Glover, who was, I say was a Boston merchant, was elected, he was appointed as magistrate. But, um, why can't Goodrich um, in Whitehall, after he heard that this American had been elected and that he was not a British subject, um, he was forced to resign his seat. 
in the legislative assembly. Now, the first order of business that the legislature performed was in January 1832. And what they did, they passed a resolution to regularize and formulate the proceedings of the assembly. And I am not an expert, but I say that that was perhaps one of the first constitutions of the Cayman Islands. They then buckled down to the business of the country, the business for which they had come together for, and they passed the militia law to, ra to raise and regulate the militia on Grand Cayman. And the law stipulated, stipulated that every free male inhabitant between 16 and 6, they had to serve in the militia. And the legislature provided musket guns and powder and uniform um, for them. And there was a, there was a, there was a, a fine of shilling and six pence a day for every person who refused to join the militia. And the militia was stationed in every district to protect the Cayman Islands and to protect their, their government in, in, North, in East End, North Side, West, uh, Georgetown, Borden Town, Guard House Hill, and in Pedro, uh, St. James. And, in, and, in, and their militia was stationed in, in Prospect and in, and, in, and in Georgetown. Robert Stephen Watler was appointed the, the first uh, senior captain of the militia and Thomas Noah Zeden was appointed the uh, captain, and Thomas John Je Janet Williams um, 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 and, and John Sharp received commissions as lieutenants. Now, they also passed many, many laws. They also passed the Rules Law, the Sabbaths Law. They passed laws that says that you had to clean the road so many times a year, and they passed laws uh, be, uh, granting liquor license. Liquor license, laws were, liquor license were granted for every three months. Uh, um, and they took charge of the Cayman Islands and they became a government. And this, this position continued um, and the governor of Jamaica was very upset about uh, this. And then the Cayman Islands then, the, the Caymanian uh, militia, uh, merchants who were also members of this assembly, decided that they were going to bypass Jamaica with their goods and services, and they started to sell their cotton, their coconuts. They were, they were, they were, they were exporting over a thousand, a million coconuts a year to Boston. They were selling goods to Boston, and they were going all the way up to Denmark and Sweden to sell their cotton, and they were bypassing Jamaica uh, because because they had they had they had they had, they had, they had, by now, established their own government, and they feel that they didn't have to pay that tonnage tax into Jamaica. So they went on to pass laws to lay the foundation to strengthen their legislative, legislative and executive power, and they passed stock laws to raise revenue, support their breakaway government. Now, one of the most important laws that they passed was a law on property. Um, they passed a law that said you had to pay um, taxes on your on your house on your on a house. Um, if a house was valued ten pounds and under, the tax was six pence. House valued sixteen to thirty pounds were taxed one shilling and eight pence. House valued thirty to fifty pounds were taxed two shillings and four pence. And house valued fifty to sixty pounds were taxed three shillings and four pence. And houses valued six to eight pounds were taxed four shillings and so forth. As, as, as the value of the house. There was also taxation on horses and mares. And they were taxed one shilling, and there was a hate tax on every, every male had to pay a tax. There were, uh, there were taxes on bulls and heifers, and cattle tax. And with those taxes, um, the Legislative Assembly then was entrenched in the Cayman Islands and the, with their militia, um, to protect their coast from any invasion, they went on to raise the Cayman Islands and to establish a, a, a form of democracy. But in 1834, Lord Sligo, governor of Jamaica, AKA Peter Brown Howe, arrived in Jamaica. And he was very upset with the with the Caymanian regime as it had, as it had, had started 
without, without permission from, from the governor of Jamaica and without permission, for, without Whitehall's authority. Now, the Caymanians were also aware that Lord Sligo was not the best of administrators because four months before he had arrived in Jamaica, he had been in prison in 1811 to 1812 for harboring 17 British deserters on his private ship in the Mediterranean. And the Caymanian establishment was not in awe of Lord Sligo and, um, because they, they, they knew that he had, he, they had given him this job so that he could come to, so that he'd come to Jamaica and, 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 and to sort of clear his name. Now, Lord Sligo decided to set out for Cayman Islands. So he came to Cayman Islands with the second West Indian Regiment, Royal Marines and the soldiers and sailors in two warships, the HMS Serpent and the, H and the, and, 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 and the HMS Hull. And, and with him was Captain Peck. He tried to persuade the Caymanians to give up their rebellion because um, he, he, Everybody thought it was, it was illegal, and he tried to persuade them to give up their rebellion, but they refused to give up their rebellion. And then he came back later in 1835, and of course, in 1834, when the ab abolition of slavery, there, most of the slaves had to serve five years apprenticeship and, and to try to spite the Caymanians, he came back in 1835, and he emancipated all of the apprentices that were in Cayman Islands. And from then on, the Caymanians and the Jamaican legislature sort of went their own way and had nothing to do with each other. And the Caymanians were passing their own laws and they were, and they were, and they were, they were protecting their border and raising taxes in order to, to, to supplement the government. Now, but around 1860, something happened. One of the wealthiest merchants in Cayman Islands, um, one of the Edens, who had then become Council General for the United States and Cayman, and Council General for Norway and Denmark, <coughs> went to Jamaica to, 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 to register his credentials with the Jamaican government. And this brought a lot of um, correspondence between the governor of Jamaica and the, and the colonial office because not only was Cayman, Cayman um, in an independent local community, but that was now seeking to establish itself internationally. And then what happened after that was that the British government decided that they were gonna put down this rebellion in, in Cayman Islands. So in 1863, they passed what is called the Cayman Act, which to the, the act to establish uh, a government for the Cayman Islands. And that act actually says in, 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 in a nutshell that the legislature of Jamaica had the power to pass laws for the peace, order, and good governance of the Cayman Islands. And it was that act that put down the Caymanian rebellion. And it also ratified all of the laws that the Caymanians had passed illegally from 1831, um, because there was a talk about how they were gonna try these men for this rebellion. Now, the act had, to, in two respects only were, uh, the Cayman Islands were, 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 were fully subordinate to Jamaica. The Supreme Court of Jamaica was to have jurisdiction over the Cayman Islands for any legal action that could not lawfully be tried in Cayman Islands or which could lawfully be referred to the courts in Jamaica. And the governor of Jamaica was also to exercise authority over the Cayman Islands as if the seam had been part of Jamaica. So that position ensued. And then the Jamaica government sent down Custos commissioners. One of the first commissioners was Sangrenetti. And then after that horse scheme, and they administered the country um, with the legislature. Now, the Legislative Assembly now then had, at that time, the Legislative Assembly a membership had risen to some 47 people with elected members, some, some elected members um, and, and magistrates 
were, uh, were, were some 47 people. And it was becoming cumbersome to, to administer the government. And, they, and, they, and, and in fact, Hearst, who was actually an alcoholic and uh, was not a great administrator, he came and he tried to push the Caymanians and, um, and they, were, they, they, they refused to be pushed by him and the whole system started to, to, to fall apart. And Hearst then was, Hearst was removed and, um, and other, other commissioners were sent. Now, the, one of the last commissioners that of the Cayman Islands was um, uh, Mr. Albert, Albert Panton and Berta Panton. They were last of the Cayman administrative class. Now, that, that, that electoral system continued until 1956 when Commissioner Donalds came and he, dis and he tried to, to establish a, 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 formal, a formal democratic legislature. And he arrived in, in, in the Cayman Islands in 1956 and he formed what, we, what, what, what was called the executive, an appointed executive council. There was Mr. E. Ormond Pant uh, uh, Panton, um, D. Desmond Watler, T.W. Farrington, O.L. Panton, um, Mr. Ornest Panton, O.L. Panton, E.D. Uh, e. Marion, W.A. McLaughlin, and Mr. Spurgeon Ebanks were the members of this council that, 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 that Major Alan Donald started to try to get some, some semblance of a democratic system in the Cayman Islands. Well, that worked fine. But in 1959, the first constitution of the Cape Islands came into effect. Um, it was written, it, it, was, it, was, it was brought in in 1959, and it came into effect on the 4th of July, 1959, and the last, the last day of the, red, of the Westry and magistrates was on the 3rd of July. And it's very interesting um, for those who is interested in, 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 in seeing how the Cape Islands developed to see the, the, the minutes of the meetings of the last assembly of, of the West in the Cayman Islands. Now, the 1959 constitution brought in what we call representative government. Um, there is an executive council. Um, con executive councilmen were charged with duties. Um, it, it, um, it had, there were, there, were, there were official members, there were nominated members, and there were elected members. Now that constitutional change started the first modern, started the first modern semblance of a, of a constitutional government in the Cayman Islands. And, now, and that continued until 19, around 1961 after the Caribbean Federation fell apart when Jamaica left. Cayman Islands was also not in a confederation but because we were a dependency of Jamaica, um, we were on the, so, on the sidelines. And it's very interesting um, to see what happened after the Federation broke up that the Cayman Islands then went to Trinidad along with other members of the Caribbean to try to find their stake in, 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 this, new, in, this, new, in this new position that, that was happening in the Cayman Islands. Now what happened then is that um, 1961, the Cayman Islands agreed with the Federation um, that um, um, with Mr. Ormond Pannon, Mr. T.W. Farrington, and, and, and who was the senior member of the legislative assembly, Ed Duke and Marion, and or Mr. Ornest Panton, that Cayman Islands was going to get a special constitution. It was going to have a, uh, the constitution would have, uh, uh, it would be a, a, a internal self-government constitution. They would, they would have a lieutenant governor, and they, they would be a, 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 a ministerial system and there would be a chief minister. But that didn't go down well with some of the members of the old vestry and it caused a lot of consternation in, in the Cayman Islands. And then in 1962, when the referendum Referendum, the 961 referendum in Jamaica, and then Jamaica left the constitution, left the, 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 the federation. Um, the Cayman Islands then um, 
were left on their own. And then in 1962, on the 18th and 19th of January 1962, the governor of Jamaica came down to the Cayman Islands. And outside this old town hall, which is on our left, is where the meetings happened on the 18th and 19th. The governor came down to explain to the Cayman Islands that Jamaica was going into independence that year on the, on the 6th of August, and that he, 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 he outlined the pros and cons of Cayman going, going into self, internal self-government with Jamaica providing them with, a def, with defense and, 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 and external affairs or and the, and, and, and the difference between becoming a crown colony directly ruled by United Kingdom. The meetings were heated, to say the least. Um, Roy McTigert, Dr. Roy McTigert, who was, who was, who wanted to came on to be, to have internal self-government, but did not want that self-government uh, uh, to be attached to any way to Jamaica. And if you read the meetings, I have a copy, and the reason why I brought all my stuff, because I think this is the only one that is left around, the old copy of all the minutes of the meetings. And, and, um, and he, he, he provided what we call the famous no gray ball, either black or white. Either we go with Jamaica or we go with the United Kingdom, become a crown colony. Well, after all the speeches and the resolution put by Dr. McTaggart, his, 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 his stance carried the day on Jamaica and came and opted to become a crown colony ruled directly from foreign commonwealth office. Now at that time, because of the new constitution that were, were going to come into place, two parties, two political parties were formed, the National Democrats and the Christian Democrats. Mr. Norman Panton, who was head of the national, president of the National Democrats, with Mr. Warren Conley and so forth, and Duke and Marion and, 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 and Mr. Willa Farrington, and that faction was was members of the Christian Democrats. And for the members of the, our, our assembly, a 1962 constitution was drafted. It was supposed to come into force on the 6th of August, 1962, along with Jamaica constitution on the same day. But by that time, the British had installed a, 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 an administrator called Jack Rose who did not like Mr. Armin Panton, and because Mr. Armin Panton was the most popular leader in the Cayman Islands, so he, was, he was certainly a populist, and everybody was worried that he would become the first chief minister. And lo and behold, the 1962 constitution did not come into force. They said that they forgot to lay it before parliament. And then the elections came again in 1965. And for the information of the members also, there's a 1965 constitution uh, 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 that was supposed to come into force in 1965. But because Mr. Ormond Patton ran in the 1965 election, that constitution didn't come into force at all either. Jack Rose maneuvered and had the British government to not um, impose that constitution. So that, so there was no 1965 constitution, there was no 1962 constitution, and that the country was governed under the old 1959 constitution until 1972 because of the animosity between the British colonial administration and the local government, the local, the local mavericks in the legislative assembly who wanted to see internal self-government, who wanted to govern themselves. Because remember, all of those years, as, we, as I have shown from 1831, Cayman had been governing themselves, and, and, in, and in fact, from 1831 until 18, uh, 1833, uh, 1863, Cayman was an independent country with its own government. So, nothing happened until 1962, 1972, when the 1972 Constitution came into force. Now, the 1972 Constitution came in, into force, and it, it, it instituted a a system of ministerial government, and instead of being charged with duties, they were given portfolios. And 
There were several amendments to the 1972 Constitution. There were the amendment in 1984, um, amendments in 1992, and then there was a consolidated amendment in 1993, which consolidated all of the all of the all of the amendments. But the most important amendment was defining who could sit in our legislature and who could and who could be an elector, and and because Caymanians were worried that other people would come into the islands and that would overpower them and take away their 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 independence, and so they made it very stringent. Um, for people to be uh, an, uh, to be elected to the legislature, legislature, it also there also it also uh, provided for the for the grand court um, to 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 in the constitution and also for the Cayman Islands Court of Appeal in the constitution. Now, so we were we were being administered under the 1972 Constitution, and then in 1992, a draft constitution was provided by the British government. And by the way, the Cayman Bar Association also had a draft constitution that was never implemented either. And the 1992 Constitution was, was, could not be agreed on. The factions uh, in Cayman Islands could not agree on the 1992 Constitution, and things, just meandered on, and then in 19 in 2003, there was an attempt at a new con another constitution again, and that draft also didn't make it to the to the assembly floor for for debate, and from 2000 and 1972 to 2000, 1992 draft 2003 draft there was no new constitution until after the white paper came out, and. And, 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 and with the, the, the modernization of Britain and, 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 and regulating the, 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 the relationship between Britain and her overseas territories, the 19th to 2009 constitution came into effect, put on by the PPM government. Now, I know that my time is limited, so I, I, I'm, I'm trying to cut my time short. but. The 1972 Constitution did not much, although it 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 it, we, we, it, it went into the, uh, it provided for 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 leadership, a political leadership, um, for 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 a, uh, a premier and his and a cabinet and his cabinet. But one of the things that we scholars of Caymanian scholars of of the Constitution says that 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 is that is that is not so great. It's Section six four to one, for Section four to three one of the our present Constitution, which says that the executive authority of the Cayman Islands is vested in Her Majesty. I think that gives us some some problems because the cabinet is not able to be autonomous on its own, and therefore. The governor of the Cayman Islands is still the chief executive officer, as it was in the old days when he was president. He's not president or speaker in the assembly now, but in cabinet, he is the chief executive officer. That is something. But there was, there's one feature of the 2009 Constitution that is very unique, and that is section 16 of the Constitution. It appears in the, in the Bill of Rights. And just for, for your indulgence, uh, a great curve indulgence just to read uh, uh, says, section 16 of the 2009 constitution uh, is the non-discrimination provisions in the entrenched bill of rights creates protection from discrimination by the government. However, the opening phrases of section 16 makes it clear that there are no are exceptions. Section 16 one states subject to subsection three, four, five, and six, Government shall not treat any person in a discriminatory manner in respect of the rights under this part of the Constitution. And subsection 3 allows laws enacted in the interest of defense, public morality, or public health of the Cayman Islands will not be discriminatory. Section, subsection 4 provides that it is not discrimination for the government to pass laws to raise revenue 
funds or to impose taxes and fees, to regulate entry, exclusion from employment, engagement in any business or profession, movement of residents within the Cayman Islands or persons who are not Caymanians. And C, in respect of adoption, marriages, divorce, burial, devolution of property on death or other matters that is the personal law ap applicable or to persons. And D, that provides privileges to disabled persons or restrictions that is reasonable, justifiable in a democratic society. And sub subsection five provides that any law which requires a person to be Caymanian or possess certain qualifications to obtain employment in the public service is not discriminatory and so on. So subsection six says that subsection one shall not apply to anything which is expressly or by necessary implication authorized to be done by any such provisions of laws as referred to in the sections above. So what does that say? It says that Cayman Islands, because of its unique um, geographical, um, because of its unique place in, in, in constitutional and, 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 and um, history has the, in this constitution has the right to practice discrimination in reverse as long as it's to protect the Caymanian people. So the government can pass any law that says you can't work in this, in this field in the, in the government or a police officer has to be Caymanian or you have to be Caymanian to be a chief officer or any of those things and it would not be discriminatory. So I think that is, that is, the, that is unique in, 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 our, in our Bill of Rights. And so Cayman then in 2009 um, formally entered into the Westminster system of government. It has a, a head of state who's the governor and it has a head of, uh, of the government, which is the premier, Mr. McLaughlin. Um, it has a presence of opposition parties. It has an elected legislature. And it has the right to pass laws. And it's abiding by all of the conventions that the Westminster system of government um, imposes on the legislature. Now, the same is not true with, with, with the system of government in the United, in United States. As we know, the United States um, system of government is quite different from the Cayman Islands system of government because the Cayman Islands, the, in, 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 the, in the US, the executive is never elected. It's always appointed by the president. And of course, they have two houses of, of, of Congress the, the, the Senate and the, and, 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 and the, and the Assembly, and, um, and they're both independent of each other. So here we are in Cayman. In 2000 and 2013, and we're able to pass laws. We're able to, we have, we have, we have moved far beyond what happened in 1831 with our, with our, with our ancestors. And um, I'm proud to say that the Cayman Islands, um, notwithstanding that, um, that, that we have two political parties that are quite different from each other in some respects, that we have good representative government and that the constitution has evolved and has, and has satisfy the test of time and today we are here in this assembly where we are members of the CPA and we can invite people to come to the Cayman Islands and, um, and we are quite proud of our democracy. Thank you. We have any questions for Mr. Mike Field? Speaker Horton. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, uh, for that presentation. Certainly, you know, lots of it is, is, is very similar. You know, I come from a place called Bermuda, which um, you know uh, has a lot of similarities with the uh, with the Caymans. 
And, and the, the question I wanted to ask with reference to when you were talking about the, the Constitution and, and uh, being able to say that you, you want to hire uh, just Caymanians. And I want to know what the situation is now in regards to uh, if a policeman, for instance, if you uh, decide that you're, you're going to hire a policeman, uh, the way that we have it, uh, our Constitution allows that you say, yes, sir, we have a Bermudian comes first, uh, but if there's not a, a Bermudian who's capable of, considered to be capable of doing that job, then it can go to someone outside the country. Is that the way you operate as well? Yes, that's the way we operate it. But, but our Constitution goes further than that. Our Constitution says that we can pass a law that actually says that only a Caymanian could be a policeman. And that, and, 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 and that would not be discriminatory under the Bill of Rights. We could, be not, could, be, we would not, be, could not be attacked under the Bill of Rights for discriminating um, um, because of nationality. Just, just two points I wanted to, to make. I, like um, Mr. Markfield, I, I'm one who, who likes this kind of stuff, <laughs> this historical <laughs> constitutional stuff. But it's important to, to note that when, when they met at Pedro St. James in 1831, and we say that that was the, the birth of democratic government in, in Cayman, that those who were entitled to vote in those elections, which were held four days after the announcement was made, were only the white landed male gentry. So it was a very small pool of people who, were, who chose that administration, which survived from 1831 till 1863 when the, when the Brits stepped back in. So whether or not it was truly democratic is a, is a, is a matter for debate. <laughs> in this day and age. But the, 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 second, the second point which I, uh, I want to, to clarify, I don't have the Constitution in, in front of me. It's the 2009 Constitution, but it's one I know reasonably well. Is while uh, I think it was Section 41, Mr. Michael, you referred to, that says that, that, um, that the Executive authority. Executive authority of the Cayman Islands is vested in Her Majesty the government. That is the case. But the section, if not that section, following sections go on to say that the executive authority is exercised by, by the governor and the cabinet of the Cayman Islands. And the reason I recall that so well is that was a battle it took, us, it took us nine years to get that constitution, with, uh, and Mr. McField had to speed through it, but there were a number of aborted yes. attempts. And part of it was over the battles with the UK about who would exercise and, and how executive authority would, would be exercised. But to get them to actually agree to write into the constitution that the executive authority would be exercised by the governor and the, the um, cabinet was, was, a, was a major feat. That must have took nearly two years of, of arguing about that. And the importance of that is that under our constitution, and even, <laughs> even as recently as when we took over in May, this debate continued with the then governor. The, the section the, the goes on to the, the not the section, the, they don't call it a chapter, but the, um, I know. the Constitution goes on to say that the cabinet is responsible for the formulation and implementation of all aspects of the, of the government, save those reserved to the governor as what are called special responsibilities. Now that is, that is a huge step for 
for Cayman or was a huge step for Cayman, one which isn't even now fully appreciated by many who are involved in, in government. Because the governor, cabinet is defined. When we had a huge battle over who should be in cabinet, we sought to exclude the governor from cabinet. The UK w said no. But what we did achieve is that the governor has no role to play in cabinet, save that as chairperson. And when I say huge, up until um, the 6th of November 2009, our cabinet was an advisory body to the governor. The governor still made the, the, all of the policy decisions. In practice, the governor rarely went against the advice of, of cabinet. But in constitutional reality, it was still a matter for the, for the governor. So where we've come to since um, 6 November 2009 is, is a huge step from where we were in, in um, up until that point, from 72, coming forward. And as I say, this is something that I don't think has even been fully grasped by, by all of those who actually are operating the system. And, and we still find ourselves having to remind um, people from time to time that, listen, this is a responsibility of, of the cabinet. The governor doesn't make these decisions. The cabinet makes these decisions. Obviously, as an overseas territory, the UK always have the, the, um, the, the ability to, ex to exercise you know, the nuclear weapon and, and say, well, ultimately we can make these decisions. But under the, under the provisions of the Constitution, as long as those are adhered to, all matters of policy are, are matters for, for the cabinet. And, and hence the division in, in, the, in the paragraph we, we started talking about, which is that executive authority is exercised in the Cayman Islands by the governor and by the cabinet. The special responsibilities relate to the public service, internal and external security, and yeah, yeah. So th those are those are the special responsibilities. So just for the sake of completeness, I thought I, I'd add that. I would just like to answer one of your questions. Um, I think we have to appreciate that in 1831, slavery was legal under the circumstances. Um, myself and um, President Roy Borden of the, from the University College of the Cayman Islands always have this big debate. Um, he, he's, he also takes the point that, well, how democratic, democratic the movement was in the rebellion was in 1831, but I think we have to put it in the context in which it, it was. But what is, not miss, what, what, is, what is not missing in 1831, that there were, there, were, there were other men other than white men in the assembly because they were all men who were free. There were coloreds and freed men in the, assembly, in the 1831 assembly. So they were not all white merchants, white slaveholders. If you were free, you could vote. And, um, and, but if, but you, if you were slave, you didn't have the vote. The other thing I would like to challenge my, your, my, my, my colleagues here is that I, I noticed that in 2003, when we celebrated our centennial year, that the names of the members of the legislative assembly then are inscribed in granite in our Heroes Park. But the names of the men who started all are not there. And I think it's very important that those names be inscribed in, in the granite in our National Heroes Park as well, because they are some of the most important men in our country. And I can't understand how they were left out. And I would ask the government, perhaps they, 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 they could do that. You weren't in charge then. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one, one, one further question I have. Maybe if, if you would. Oh, sorry. Um, no, no, I'll, no, no, please. please no, I'll, I'll... Maybe as the chairman of the Quincentennial Committee, I can tell you why the members on that day were put and if you notice, they're put on the wall facing outside of Hero Square. Was because I was I received a letter 
four days before it was opening that we would have to move all of the people names that we had selected to put as the 500 nation builders in there from the from the square um, so in order to prevent them from carrying out their threat I decided to put their names on the back wall and it was very intriguing to sit there as chairman with all of them sitting behind me as we unveiled it and they saw that their names were on it the idea of, move, of removing the people and placing them in the districts disappeared by putting their names on it so that's why their names are there not that they were receiving any special recognition because they are on the outside of the park I just, I just want to make it very clear. Now, my name is there too, but I'm not one of them you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, just, just one, one question I had. That is true. It was the people in the government at the time that the letter came from. I got five signatures on it. I, I keep, I, it's posted on, on the wall in my study as a conversation piece. Okay. Right. You, you, you're talking about the, the, the limited people who, who, who voted, you know, when we go back to 1831 and, and, and on. When, when was uh, universal uh, adult suffrage uh, in, in, in this country? When, I think it was point? in 1948. Yes, 48. that's when we have universal suffrage. Um, some, some countries, in, in some modern countries didn't have it until later. Yeah, in yes. Bermuda, we didn't have it until like 1963. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be remiss of us if we didn't include this significant date of 1959 when Cayman women rose to the forefront via petition to make sure they had a right to vote. I'm sure you could help us remember that. Yes. 1959? What was, the, what was that? The petition with the women from Bordentown and Georgetown. Oh, yes. Um, th that, uh, that is very significant. That is part of National Heroes Square. Um, the, when, when women were not allowed to vote, and it was in 1959 um, when the women, um, most of the women, women from, uh, it started in Borden Town, I believe, and most of the women in the Cayman Islands at the time who signed this petition to the, to the, to the governor, uh, to the uh, governor for the right to vote. And, um, and, it, and, it, and it, 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 gathered, it, gathered, it gathered a storm. And the, as a result of that, the Sex, sex Non-Discrimination Act was passed, which gave women the right to vote in the Cayman Islands. That was a, that's a significant part of our history, and that is enshrined in, in National Heroes Park, rec recognizing the women. But I think one of, one of the one of the things that that we don't have in our classrooms is the contribution of some of the most prominent Caymanians, like Webster, who was the treasurer of the assembly and who did such a tremendous job, um, and, and, and Parsons, and Albert Panton, and, and Mr. Bertie Panton, who was the last commissioner, last commissioner class, um, that they administered this country for, 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 for decades without, without, without incident. And um, I think that we, we, we ought to really to remember them. I see when, I, when, I have, when I'm privileged to go behind to go behind the um, behind the the walls of the of the of this hollowed walls and go in on the other side, I see photographs of them there. But I don't think that's enough. I think there 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 ought to be plaques in this assembly, um, and because this assembly, in in my in my humble opinion, needs a lot of extension and renovations to 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 include those people as you walk into the halls that you know who they are. And there, there's some biography of what they have done, what they have contributed to the Cayman Islands. Minister Rivers. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I would just also like to point out another very historical and, and monumental part of our history that actually predated the 59 um, island-wide petition, but it was actually started about 10 years prior to that by 24 women, brave women in Georgetown mm -hmm. that started the movement. So I think, um, I'm sure, Mr. McPhee, it, it, it would not, you know, it would be remiss of us not to recognize that in yes. our chronological um, expose of our parliamentary democracy yes. and the evolution in this country. So I'd like to just Thank you. make that known. 
Okay, if there's no further questions for Mr. McPhee, we'll take a 10 minute break so we can start our session number three. We're a bit behind, so if everybody could actually come back at 12 o'clock exactly. Thank you.